Welcome to the Lover's Hole, a Patrick O'Brien podcast. You're with Ian and Mike as we continue our voyage through the Aubrey Matchery novels of Patrick O'Brien. Mike, we're still in the early stages of Ionian Mission, I think. Can you remind us all where did we get to last week and what might be in store in this episode? You bet, Ian. Well, last week we pulled Ionian Mission off the shelf. We took a peek into Stephen and Jack's lives using the metaphor of marriage as as either a bed of roses or a battlefield. And Stephen and Diana seem to be living in the bed of roses. They're, They're living separately, but they're together every day. They're enjoying their lives. They're enjoying each other. We even had some hints that Diana might be pregnant. Now, Jack, on the other hand... Wasn't doing well with roses at Ashgrove Cottage or the battlefield of his life. His legal problems and his temper have gotten out of hand. His attorney suggested that he leave England as soon as possible to avoid charges for some of his rash actions, like throwing an opposing attorney out of a second story window through the glass (laughs) and to pay for the glass (laughs) on the way out. His fortunes at the Admiralty have changed. There's a new First Lord. Andrew Ray's acting second secretary, and that's cost him this new frigate that he was going to be commanding for the North American station. He's lost that, and he could barely get an assignment to get out of England on a corruptly built, deteriorating ship of the line, the Worcester. And he's headed for the Toulon blockade duty, not not exciting duty here. Yeah. Good news is that Tom Pullings and Mowat are going to be with him. Stephen luckily just made the departure of the ship, uh, delayed by some antics by Yagiello. Always good to have him back again. Yeah. And Stephen will be aboard with an intelligence mission. Right, And surprisingly, we learned that Bach had a father. Yeah, Less surprisingly, <laughs> and we we saw that O'Brien, with all this incredible emphasis on historical accuracy, is still all over the place on musical references. But we do have Killick, we have toasted cheese, we have music, and we have a little dodgy gunpowder to console Jack on this journey as they get ready to head for the Toulon blockade. So this week we'll be <laughs> we'll be leaving. Yeah, we'll be leaving. Jack will be exercising the great guns and working to bring his new ship together. We've got some very interesting guests to pick up for the voyage, Parsons and Professors forsooth, <gasps> and the promise of perhaps a little action at sea as the Ionian mission starts to pick up its pace. Oh, it's going to be great. We're going to be at sea, and we're, I think, back in traditional Patrick O'Brien territory. I think it's going to be great. Yes. So, Mike, the whole thing, I think we, we pick up the story in Plymouth, right? They were first departing from Portsmouth and they've coasted down to Plymouth. They've been getting settled in after an evening's music. We have this scene of a happy Captain Aubrey, Captain Jack Aubrey, seeing new masts and sails come aboard. He also welcomes aboard new crew members from the skate, although I don't think the skates are going to be very happy. Right. Uh, and two young, young lieutenants or lieutenants, Um, Collins and writing. Hmm, I don't know if Collins and writing is meant to be a clever, jokey juxtaposition of (laughs) the name of a publisher and the name of an activity. I don't know. Anyhow, Jack's really pleased to see that Pullings, his first lieutenant, is taking them in hand. They lose not a minute changing into their working clothes and getting to work. And meanwhile, Mike, there's this kind of Chekhov's gun moment. Well, maybe not Chekhov's gun. You know, the, the idea of Chekhov's gun is that if a weapon has been placed on a table in Act 1 of a play, it's going to have to be used by the end of Act 3. And we hear a lot about this gunpowder. And it's it's nowhere near as subtle as Chekhov's gun in reality. Jack's going to sit down with the gun <clears throat> with the gunner, Mr. Borrell, to explain the markings on this gunpowder that he's bought from a fireworks factory. Jack says it may not be fighting powder, but will answer very well for practice. Let a dozen rounds be filled for each gun. And a little bit of foreboding there. We should stick a pin in that because a dozen rounds is a lot. Right, right. So Jack, Jack's very keen. Nonetheless, he's going to follow the school of Douglas and Collingwood, bring cannon within range of the enemy, and then fire with extreme speed and accuracy is his motto. And it looks like Mr. Borrell the Gunner is absolutely of the same mind as Jack. This martial spirit, I think, is just dampened a tiny bit with the news of the arrival of a boat full of Parsons and a boat with a lady in mourning and a young child. Yeah, it's it's we're kind of 
wondering, you know, who is this? And and that night over a Scarlatti piece that that Jack and Stephen are playing together, Jack tells Stephen that this boy, this young boy, Mr. Calamy, is the son of a captain that Jack had been shipmates with in the Theseus. Uh, his father's ship had been mm-hmm. lost with all hands in a big storm, and his mother absolutely wanted her son to sail with Jack, despite all the better opportunities, the better stations, better positioned captains. Uh, she was insistent and Jack's taking young Calamy on board with him, despite not wanting to have, you know, kind of this nursery of youngsters. He's he's accommodating his former shipmate. And I think it's, it's a nice little twist for Jack's character, who is still in the doghouse, I think, in O'Brien's view. Right. A, a, a bit of a chance of redemption, you know, a bit of a chance to pick up a... Uh, a wholesome relationship with somebody who can, who he can take under his wing, the, the chance to enjoy a connection, even though it's a sad connection, to another member of the service. I think this is a nice thing for Jack to take Calamy aboard, and I have a feeling that we're going to hear from Calamy as a secondary character as the book goes on. Ah, there you go. Well, we've got our our lose not a minute, Jack. The Worcester is about to set out and a big blow starts up and it continues blowing for days. Matter of fact, we heard that the blockading squadron off Brest has you know, been put out to sea. Um, the shores around them are littered with old and new wreckage. And, and O'Brien tells us a lot of it from the Royal Navy yeah. because her ships being constantly at sea for so long are now wearing out that they'd lost 13 that year from that kind of disintegration and storms, you know, not to mention those taken by the Americans and the French. And he, he doesn't mention the aerial, but of course the aerial is among them right. on, on exactly this stretch of coast, not, not, not one book ago. Yeah, That's exactly right. Yes. Well, as they're sitting and waiting to get out and, and Jack wanting to get out of England, he continues to receive discouraging letters from his lawyers. And, and O'Brien tells us he's looking more and more careworn and old. <sighs> Which is a theme we've had before as well. And I think we're going to come back to in this book, the idea that the, the main characters and mankind generally are getting a bit long in the tooth. Yes. Poor old Jack. Poor old Jack. So what's he been doing to compensate for this feeling of uh, of decrepitude. He's been dining with the other captains. He's been drinking a lot to forget his legal worries. And that brings him to the subject of asking Stephen how Stephen's getting along with the wardroom messmates, because it's still a bit of a newly formed wardroom. And of course, eating in the wardroom along with Stephen and the lieutenants are going to be these parsons. Now, one of them, it turns out, is not a parson. He's a moral philosopher and he's headed for Mahon. And we get this really nice dialogue. First of all, um, Jack asking Stephen how moral philosophy differs from Stephen's kind, from the natural philosophy. And he says, why natural philosophy? This is Stephen. He's not concerned with ethics, virtues and vices or metaphysics. The fact that the dodo has a keel to her breastbone, whereas the ostrich and her kind have none, presents no moral issues. We erect hypotheses, to be sure, some of us to a most stupendous height, but we always hope to sustain them by demonstrable facts. And he goes on to say that your moral philosopher is in pursuit of wisdom rather than of knowledge. And indeed, what he's concerned with is not so much the object of knowledge as of intuitive perception. Certainly, he says, the few moral philosophers I've known do not seem to have been outstandingly successful in either. Whereas some natural philosophers, and Stevens are waxing a little bit, right. <laughs> a bit philosophical, you might say. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And he's showing off a little bit, I think, that, you know, he's he's in his home territory debating um, philosophy, but he's about to be undercut by the very, very broad humor of Jack Aubrey. Yeah. I, I just love this. As, as, as Stephen is waxing on, he sees this look on Jack's face and realizes that Jack is meditating on a joke. And, and Jack, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, Brian tells it better. So I suppose, Jack said, smiling so broadly that his blue eyes were not more than twinkling slits in his red face, that you and Sir Humphrey could be described as immoral philosophers, to which Stephen replies, sure, there may be some poor, thin, barren minds that would catch at such a paltry clench, said Stephen, pothouse wits that might, if their beery genius soared so high, call Professor Graham an unnatural philosopher. (laughs) (laughs) 
And it's funny, this this joke and the, the duality of maybe maybe there's such a thing as an immoral philosopher and an unnatural philosopher. That was a joke that we heard um, shared with our guest James Albright and his wife, who herself is a moral philosopher. Right, along with her natural philosopher oh. husband. <laughs> So we've got some really cheap dad jokes by Jack. We've got the ship's company beginning to assemble. Mike, this is starting to sound like the opening chapters of a Patrick O'Brien novel. What's going to happen next? Well, we get to see the composition of the wardroom. And we have this individual, Mr. Summers, who I think Jack was trying to get rid of. Doesn't have a high opinion of Summers. He'd rather have had any one of a couple of others. We have a fe- He's feeling that Summers had waited to report aboard until all the hard work was finished and that Summers was quite happy to let pullings and the others kind of carry the weight and that exercises jack a little bit i think he prefers the idea that people will do their fair share and will report on board promptly and will be honorable in you know joining the wardroom that's something that i think we're going to have to come back to we're going to have to see how summers develops as a character meanwhile Stephen and jack move on and uh, i think they dust off a bit of scarlatti right right yeah a little scarlatti a little discussion about the parsons well The blow starts to diminish a little bit, and Jack wants to make sure that theirs is the first ship out to sea. He gets out so fast that he barely shaves the headland, and he's trying to make sure, one, I got to get out of here, out of my lawyer's reach. I don't want to wait around and get saddled with a convoy. And Jack being Jack is thinking, wait a minute, you know what? We've had this breast blockade blown off. Maybe a French privateer might have gotten out and run into the ocean while the squadron was mm-hmm. away from the station. Uh, so he's thinking, you know, I may not be a very fast ship, but I've got this 721-pound broadside. I've got a full complement of 613 people, and I just may be able to snap something up a little bit on the way over here. Um, but first, He's got to find out how do they handle the guns, especially on their lower deck. You know, they've had this storm. They haven't been able to do much practice on the lower deck. And uh, the gunner has kind of gotten back to him. As you say, we keep hearing about this gunpowder saying that a lot of the new gunpowder kegs that Jack had bought are unmarked. They smell and taste a little old fashioned, but the, the gunpowder he's opened so far at least was dry, which is particularly important given that the, the powder room and the lower deck and pretty much all of the ship is very damp, very moldy. And Jack is really starting to quiz the gunner and Stephen and others about what's the potential impact of all these curious added fireworks chemicals like antimony. What what impact is that going to have on the guns? So yeah, they, they beat to quarters. This is the, the moment that Jack thinks, okay, I'm going to shake down the crew. I'm going to see how the weapons are functioning and I'm going to give the first outing to this firework gunpowder. And as he's often done before, Jack wants to, I think, show the ship's company what good looks like. He wants to set a high standard. So there's Barrett Bond in there on the starboard chaser he gets the starboard chaser's crew led by Bondon to fire the first three shots and he measures the timing of the shots. It says, Bondon lit the second charge and the gun uttered an enormously loud, high-pitched, unnatural screeching bellow jetting out a vast tongue of brilliant white light in which the fragments of wad showed momentarily black. It was a miracle alone that prevented the astonished crew from being crushed by the recoil. And Jack stops this capering about with a gun and the the rest of the broadside goes on and we get all these crazy colors coming out it says this time the gun belched crimson a noble long-lasting crimson flame crimson smoke a deep solemn musical boom and here's the snag all along the deck the exact discipline of the gun crews dissolved in delighted laughter Silence fore and aft, we get from Jack, and yet more colours, strange unheard of bangs, infinite mirth, a truly wretched performance. Oh, Mike, poor Jack. I I wonder if we're meant to see (laughs) that there's a bit of a metaphor here about Jack Aubrey and his weapon making him a figure of ridicule. Right, right. And I'm, I'm kind of expecting Jack to be really upset. I mean, the regulation powder bonded fires 51 seconds, and then it's minutes before the second shot and, and, and an abysmal performance all around. But I was really surprised that later, Jack and Stephen again are together in the evening, 
And Jack's reporting that this is like the most cheerful exercise he's ever seen, that it was as good as a real action for pulling all his people together. And he he loves it that when everybody was on the lower deck, were slinging their hammocks, they're all laughing together. So he's thinking, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm going to have a happier ship. We're going to get together. And he's planning to take them out the next day to, as he calls it, break some glass. And he says that there's nothing like danger and smashing valuable defended property to make a gun crew steady and to keep them from wasting their shots. So, you know, we're yeah. coming up, uh, the Worcester's approaching the French coast. It's nighttime. And, you know, I, I love you pointed out that uh, our navigation is a little bit better than the aerials last time. Yeah, they have double lunars and aboard ship, they have three, count them, three functioning <laughs> chronometers. Oh. So they <laughs> <laughs> what, whatever might get them this time, it's not going to be being out on their longitude. <laughs> so th- they're up before two bells in the morning watch. It's nighttime. They're securing the navigation, but they're trying to get in close with the coast. And they think that they've seen a light ahead. Pullings and Moat are already on deck. The mist parts to reveal a ship. And by the way, this is classic Aubrey single ship encounter, right? Through the mist or at the dawn or in the murk or in the dark, they encounter a solitary other ship. And this is exactly what we've encountered here. So maybe this is going to be a regulation Patrick O'Brien dust up between Jack Aubrey's ship and the French. So who is it? Well, we discover that this ship is moving quickly. She's under light sail. Jack realizes that he's going to have to draw her a long way south to prevent her turning and running for the French battery. So he's got a tactical problem here. And he remembers, key point, that he didn't load regulation powder again after the last gunnery practice. Yeah. The the good news is he remembers too that, you know, the, the gunpowder, while it has this crazy colors and sounds, still throws the ball just as far as regulation shot. And and he's glad of it because when he finally gets a decent view, he sees that this French 74, Jamap, um, you know, mm. this is going to be a great like ship on like ship action. And her commander, Jack's a little bit surprised to see, instead of running, is running straight for Jack. He's ready to go into action, even though Jack's prepared and she clearly is not. So Jack veers away, trying to pull her, as you said, Ian, further south, thinking, yeah. you know, I've, I've got this slow, unwieldy ship. She's got this thing that is just flying through the water under light sail. I can't give her the chance to turn around. I want to pull her out here, and then I want to fire and board her and take her. So that's what he's planning yeah. to do. But you guys got to wait, wait, wait. And Jamap pulls up, turns, fires a broadside. It falls a little short, but there are a lot of ricochets that bounce off and come on board, damaging some sails, you know, bunching up, beating up some boats there. And then they fire another broadside, and it really strikes Worcester well. And Jack's wanting to wait one more broadside before he goes in to let this timing and the run go. But this injured mainsail that he has, it tears free. Yeah. Jack has to haul it up. He's losing his way, and 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 kind of the game is up for him a little bit here. Yeah, he is, and it's 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 really sad. I think after we had what looked to me like a really routine build up to a classic Patrick O'Brien action, things have gone wrong for Jack Aubrey. He was overly sensitive about the crew's willingness to tolerate another broadside. I think on other occasions he would have just held them steady. He slightly misjudged the intentions of the Frenchman, and they discharge a broadside and there's all this colored smoke and for whatever reason i don't know if the frenchman get, thinks that it's a secret weapon or is just spooked but the frenchman straight away turns tail and jack is left aboard this rather slovenly performing worcester realizing that he's now not got especially with the main tack shot away he now can't chase the frenchman inshore so what looked like a promising action has kind of been undone and i get this feeling like of a little bit of low-key humiliation for jack you know that was all going to be perfectly straightforward and jack i think is a little bit a bit humiliated on first inspection he's slightly misjudged the situation and as a result of being a little bit too keen to get his broadside in you know, ignoring his his instincts, he's left facing a, a, a chase, but that's not all that he has to contend with. You're right. And she's running away. Jack's trying to redeem himself a little bit and go after, 
But he turns and finds that this new crew is celebrating. You know, we won, we won, we forced the French to flee. So then he sees there's this look of tremendous disappointment on Pulling's face or this, you know, Mm. incredible look. Um, and, And Jack is thinking to himself, well, oh, my gosh, if I'd held my fire for another five minutes, then this ship would have been ours. We would have boarded her. We would have taken her. And Poolings would have either been a corpse or a commander. And he realizes that, you know, this is it, that that Poolings has no connections. Um, he really doesn't stand a chance of getting promoted other than with a victory like this. But we've had this thing. So Jack kind of looks at Poolings. He's not quite sure, I think, what to say, but he says, "How? what's the casualty report? And Poolings says, no dead, sir. Three splinter wounds and a crush foot. No more. And number seven, lower deck, dismounted. But I am sorry to tell you, sir, I am very sorry to tell you the doctor has copped it. Oh, my gosh. So take us back, Mike, because you've, you've read the canon a few times now. How did you read this? Well, the first time you got to this piece of text. So you, you, know, you, you had introduced me to this thing you know, like in 2009, I was going through a pretty tough time in my life anyway. <laughs> and and yeah. I get to this point where halfway through the canon and I'm thinking, the doctor has copped it. Oh my gosh, Matron is dead? What's going on here? I'm you know, I'm used to George R. R. Martin and you know, you, nobody lives <laughs> forever here. <No. laughs> so we we just had pullings with this great disappointment, or was that the look on his face? Why is he so sorry to tell Jack? Um, O'Brien's taken pains to point out during the battle that Stephen did not go below. He was waiting for the first wound need to come down. Jack sees him standing there, but doesn't have time to talk to him. It, it, you know, he tells us we didn't have time to hang any splinter netting, and there were all these splinters flying. Jack had warned Calamy after the battle started that a ball might well take off his head. We just read that Pullings could be either be a commander or a corpse. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this was O'Brien again setting me up. All these signs are here. Yeah. And, you know, O'Brien, every time there was some great thing, like we take all the ships with all the gold, ah, we don't get to have it. Every time something is going really good, yeah. O'Brien flips it over. I'm thinking, he was just telling us how Stephen and Diane are doing so great at the beginning of this book. Oh my God, now he killed <laughs> Stephen. I can't believe it. I'll never forgive him. So I don't know. Maybe, maybe- well, I think it's it's a really good example of how the, how the writing takes you wherever you are. I, I, I didn't get that, but there's absolutely no reason to do with the writing. That means I didn't get that message. I was just kind of in it and believing somehow in Stephen's immortality. It's a really, really great moment. Exactly as you say, Mike, he's triggered all of this um, foreboding, all this jeopardy for Stephen, almost putting Stephen in the way of being a Jack Aubrey type character, you know, right. l- leaving him on the deck while the action starts. And that would have been the mother of all undercuts. You know? Oh my gosh. <laughs> all right. I, I often wonder going back on that when copped it, I thought, you know, copped it's not an expression yeah. I use. And I thought, well, maybe it's an American English versus real English. <laughs> Um, I, you know, I just didn't know. So I was, I was thrilled to find out that maybe he wasn't, but of course he, he ends the, um, he ends the chapter here. So I had to, I had to turn the page to find out. And this, you know, I think you had told me that this, this scene reminded you of, of a scene from Greyhound as well, right? Yeah. For, entirely from the perspective of Aubrey, right? Aubrey has... Right overplayed his hand he's reacted too soon he committed himself too quickly and as a result he lost the action and he he kind of reflects that he's a little bit humiliated by this and it reminds me a lot of the um, the story of charlie kraus in greyhound where kraus as a as a middle-aged man an aging middle-aged man overcooks his first attack on a u-boat and fails and the u-boat gets free and in the and in the case of the movie you know, the, the Tom Hanks character, Charlie Krause, looks across the water at the burning ships and reflects that this is his mistake. And I got a little bit of that same humiliation of the of the, the officer feeling his age a little bit and feeling that he's been held out as a little bit indecisive and a little bit wanting in judgment and composure. But thank heavens that all we've got is a little bit of 
bad feeling for Jack and that Stephen is still with us after all. Right, right. I mean, if Stephen had done in, we, you know, we've we certainly been saying that Jack needs some redemption and, and that would, you know, Bach yeah. or no Bach, Scarlatti or no Scarlatti, that would have been a pretty low moment for Jack as, as well as for Stephen here. And that, especially after all Absolutely. the danger Stephen's been in to just, you know, cop it on the deck of a of a small action that oh but we do turn the page and we learn that Stephen has is wounded he's been as o'brien says brought low and actually mm. uh, it sounds you know not just a wound i mean o'brien writes first a falling shoulder block knocked him down that a jagged lump of elm from the hounds of the mizzen topmast ripped off half his scalp and lastly, one of a shower of 18-inch splinters driven from the Worcester's quarterdeck birthing by a 32-pound ball struck both his feet as he lay there, struck them flatwise, piercing the list slippers and his soles. The wounds were spectacular, and he left an uninterrupted trail of blood as he was carried below, but they were not serious, and his assistants sewed him up again. Uh, they've got him back on the tincture of laudanum which worried me a bit. And then O'Brien writes kind of, <laughs> you know, to kind of lighten it up now, finally, it was not the wounds, therefore, nor the loss of blood, nor the pain that brought him so low, but rather the incessant flow of visitors. <laughs> it's great, isn't it? If it, I, it struck me that these are very Jack Aubrey-esque wounds right you know scalp wounds and splinter wounds and being knocked over this is like the the kind of blows that jack aubrey sustains in the battle but it's stephen sustaining them the difference is how does he respond the ship's company <laughs> and especially the parsons all come and visit him and stephen is having none of it i, I can remember mike when uh stephen had been set about by the by the french in mahon back in post captain and he's back ashore we know already that he's not the world's best patient <laughs> No. Some people, it turns out, his assistants leave him alone because they know for sure that he's a, a petulant tyrant, that he's dogged and stubborn, and he will resist anybody's attempts to treat him kindly. And they withdraw as well because Stephen's got authority over them. No such authority does he have over the ship's guests, these parsons and the other officers. And poor old Stephen has to tolerate a round of visits Pullings and Moat visit him daily, and I think he's okay with that. Members of the wardroom visit, I think he's okay if they stay not too long, but the Parsons have got nothing to do but show up and talk and talk. And in the text it says, had it not been for the blessed opium that allowed him to plane above his irascibility some of the time, his well-wishers would have worried him into his coffin, a hammock with two round shot at his feet before they raised the Rock of Lisbon. For although he could put up with pain tolerably well, he always found boredom mortal. And it says, apart from the inventor of the double bottom defecator, which I can only guess is some kind of compost device um, that one of the Parsons had come up with, apart from the inventor of this thing, whose history he had heard seven times over, they had nothing to say. And they said it for what seemed like hours, while his smile grew more fixed and rigid until at last it came to resemble the Rhesus Sardonicus. Now, that, that's a Latin tag that's got to be worth digging into for a second there, Mike. Yeah, I'm thinking smile fixed and rigid. Rhesus Sardonicus is this condition of, of a muscle spasm, the facial muscles, that produces this really intense, bizarre, abnormal grinning. It's caused by tetanus, strychnine poison, uh, and has been reported after judicial hanging. So yeah. I think uh, I think O'Brien has chosen wisely here in this description. Yes. It's not just a rash. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> exactly. And I love the description of people showing up with nothing to say as well. I, I went digging for – this sounded like a quotable quote. This sounded like the sort of thing that O'Brien might have been alluding to. But if you look for quotes uh, of people talking about uh, folks showing up with nothing to say, but nonetheless saying it at length. There are loads of them. Um, probably the most O'Brien specific uh, is a quote from Jonathan Swift, um, who was, of course, an 18th century philosopher who said, there are few wild beasts more to be dreaded than a talking man having nothing to say. Nice. Closely followed, I think, my, my, se my, my second favorite by George Eliot, the Victorian novelist. Blessed is the man who, having nothing to say, 
abstains from giving wordy evidence of the fact. Love that. Love, Love that. Well, I, I I had to do a quick look up on double bottom defecator because, like you, Ian, I thought this is this is a little potty mm-hmm. humor by O'Brien, and and there's no doubt I think he chose this for that, but it's actually an invention that was used in sugar refineries. <laughs> oh, <laughs> in the, right, in the Indies. It's a real thing, but I think O'Brien probably chose it for the name <laughs> and, and put it there just for us. I think he probably did. I can think of any uh, of a references coming up in Treason's Harbor as well as a similar oh. uh, a similar toilet humor connection. There you go. So now it's time for us to take a short break. We're going to be right back in a few moments. If you're enjoying the podcast, please come and join our supporters on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash lovers hole. Welcome back. You're with Ian and Mike listening to The Lubber's Hole. Anyhow, Stephen manages to turn the corner and he's getting better. Um, the Worcester comes alongside in Gibraltar, famously stinky naval harbour in the Mediterranean. Professor Graham, I think, is welcome relief for Stephen after he's tolerated all the, the boring uh, discussions with the, uh, the other persons who came visiting. Um, they have this conversation about languages. Graham learns that Stephen speaks Catalan, although he didn't recognize the language for what it was. And he gets to learn a little bit about Stephen's background, his upbringing and his heritage. Stephen compliments Graham, on the other hand, on his Graham's mastery of Turkish and Arabic. And they're still sizing each other up, I think. Graham is willing at this point to confess a bit of ignorance. And he says that he wants to know why Jack fired off those colored balls, those colored um, gunpowder charges in battle. And Stephen explains how captains have to supply their own gunpowder for practice and that um, the the Navy otherwise doesn't allow them very much um, allowance for doing anything other than fighting. Graham thought that it might have been a deceptive trick, that he was trying somehow to hoodwink the French. And Stephen replies with another Latin tag, est summum nefas falere, which I think might mean deceit is gross impiety. Have we got a connection there that we can follow up? Well, it's it's funny. So not 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 a Latin scholar. Yeah. Um, I didn't realize that, but apparently, in a typical Latin grammar, this is part of a well-known mnemonic about two nouns that cannot be declined. The neuter gender is assigned, and they they use this as the example here. This deceit is gross impiety. And so I guess for O'Brien, he's thinking, okay, a lot of my readers, this little rhyme is going to run right through their minds here. Oh, great. So if you were raised as a schoolboy on Latin in the middle of the 20th century, yeah. this will be like nursery rhymes to you, but to the rest of us, <laughs> to the rest of us, we have fun looking it up and kind of looking behind it. Now, we've got this, the beginning of what I think is a, is a sort of awkward, uncomfortable turn in the conversation, because having gone from complimenting each other on their linguistic abilities and Graham politely opening up the conversation by saying, you know, tell me more about what, what Jack was doing. Um, Stephen flings out this thing about deceit being gross and piety. Graham thinks that Stephen's joking because this thing about impi- the deceit and impiety, well, clearly there was deceit things, right? There was deceit because um, Captain Aubrey flew a Fr- French flag and why did he not also fly a signal of distress? And Stephen tries to then begin to explain the different gradations of deceitfulness that are somehow permissible. Um, he says, the nautical mind's understanding of iniquity. Um, Graham argues that there's no point in having a graduated justification for for different degrees of uh, of deceit because the means justify the ends this is graham employing a little bit of early 19th century philosophy he's being a bit of a utilitarian he says the means are justified by the ends war is a time for efficient action not for the display of fine feelings nor the discussion of relative merits of forgery and false pretenses 
Now, this is almost, this could have been the end of the conversation, I think, if Stephen had been willing to let Graham just have his, have his nice little philosophical button that he sewed on the conversation. But Stephen keeps the conversation rolling. He does. He, you know, Stephen has to tell him that there's a great many contradictions in naval moral law and logic, but they're all well understood and accepted and practiced by all. And he, and he tells him that, you know, if you ever violate these, you know, you would be kind of the hiss of the world here. And that with all this understanding, even though they've got these gradations in, in immorality and impiety, that uh, they operate very successfully despite the complexity of the ships and the boisterous, capricious elements in which they sail. <laughs> and he's, again, we're getting this slight tone of levity, and it's a great way of keeping the conversation going with somebody like Jack. But I think Stephen's starting to misjudge the conversation with Graham. Right. So Graham's really impressed yeah. by the fact that the, the, the Navy has this success, that they managed to do complex feats like navigation, um, that I think he's trying to suggest that it's not all superstition and hocus pocus. There must be some rationality and some some successful practice in what goes on in the Navy. And he thinks that the knowledge and skill that you need to command and run a ship must be intuitive. And he supposes that it dies with each individual and that it's like instinct. So Stephen gets to join back in on the conversation and says, well, there are captains who've communicated their knowledge and improved on the knowledge of others by uh, developing rudders and jury masts and he starts to show off a little bit mouses or mice and puddings puddings asks graham i'm not going to do the scottish accent at this point mike puddings stephen replies yes puddings we trice them athwart the starboard gumbrels when sailing by and large Oh, Mike, I think he might have gone a half a step too far because and Stephen notices this. He notices that Graham is taking all of this in. He realizes just too late that Graham's somebody with a good memory who can internalize and then remember long passages by rote and has to admit defeat at this point and defer to Stephen's understanding. And having pulled Graham's leg a little, <laughs> Stephen changes the conversation. And Mike, I, I think I'm getting a little guilty confessional moment here from O'Brien. I think he's sympathizing a bit with Graham for having been the victim of a bit of joking and a bit of showing off by Stephen. But I think he's really showing that he, O'Brien, might have been in the same situation as Stephen, you know, realizing that he's shown off a little bit too far and just realizes in Graham's change of manner that this might come back to bite Stephen in the future. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I mean, he, I think he, you know, and, and Stephen, we know, has been played upon so many times. And, and as you said, with Jack, with other members of the crew, this is great fun. But Graham's already somebody who earlier in the conversation has shown that he does not like anybody kind of poking fun, mm -hmm. making fun. He's very kind of a serious, straight ahead guy, this moral philosopher. But I think Stephen is, you're right. He's he's backing off and saying, you know, uh, what, what, tell me what you know about the clergy on board. Tell me what's required for an Anglican to, you know, to be ordained. And uh, Graham tells him, you know, I, I, I don't really know that much about them because like all of my countrymen, I'm, you know, so many of them, I'm a Presbyterian. But he says, Stephen, you know, you should know all about Anglicans because you're a naval officer. And Stephen informs him that he's of the Romish persuasion, <laughs> that you know, he's a Catholic. And, you know, Graham's astounded. And Stephen says, no, no, because I'm a warrant officer, I didn't have to forswear the Pope. But he says, it also means that I'll never be an admiral. Of course, the height of naval ambition. And now Graham definitely realizes he's yeah. being toyed with. Uh, you know, about Stephen becoming an admiral and a surgeon could never hope to be an admiral. And he's very offended by what he calls his jocularity and being trifled with. And so we're, you know, this thing just kind of keeps getting just a little bit worse here. And I think Stephen was trying to de-escalate it, but but ended up escalating it a yeah, bit. Here. Yeah, he did. And again, Mike, it occurs to me, this is another bit of a reversal. This is a bit of conversational awkwardness and heavy handed humor, the kind of thing that Jack Aubrey might have done on another occasion in another book. But here it's Stephen, who's, to use the Jack Aubrey phrase, getting himself onto a bit of a conversational Lee Shaw. Right. Now, if it if it was just Graham and he was just somebody here, one chapter gone the next, then we could just say it's a bit of conversational color. But if Graham's going to turn out to be an important character, this could be a bit of a handicap for how Stephen and he can work together. Let's see what's going to happen. 
Anyhow, Mike, we're, we're, st- yeah. we're still in Gibraltar. And I, I, I want to say, I love the moment that comes up shortly here where O'Brien sets the scene. He describes the folks on shore. He describes the light of the morning and he describes the colors of the different cultures and races and nationalities and uniforms. And it was lovely cinematic writing. And he seems to really like writing visually about light in this way. But anyway, moving on, Graham and Stephen are watching the birds and the beasts ashore in Gibraltar. Right, right. They're, they're on deck up there. You know, Stephen's watching out. Graham comes up to approach him again. And it's another one of those fabulous O'Brien scenes where Stephen is watching this ape stare up at a vulture. It's the vulture that Stephen had been watching before until he noticed the ape. Now he's looking at the ape and the vulture. And it's in front of Mount Misery. I'm thinking, wow. How is this for some foreshadowing oh, yes. ape looking up at a vulture in front of Mount Misery? And Graham at that moment tells Stephen that Graham has a cousin in a confidential post in government who's concerned with gathering accurate and sensitive information and is looking for a gentleman to assist him. So Graham is essentially recruiting Stephen to be an intelligence agent. Mm. And Graham goes on to say that, yeah, given Stephen's fluency in Mediterranean languages, all these people he knows ashore who've come to visit him, given that he's Catholic and all his cousins' people are Protestants, Stephen would make a great candidate. And he, you know, he hastens to point out that his cousin pays very well. And it's, it's funny, I, I half wondered whether this was a sort of a false flag or some great deep subtlety on the part of Graham. But actually, I think he was just flat out trying to recruit Stephen, not realizing, of course, that he, Graham, is way behind the curve. Great. <laughs> uh, and all, all, of the, all of the attributes that, that Stephen clearly has that he's pointing out are already known and, and being exploited in the intelligence community. So I think, again, it serves to make Stephen's right. life a little bit uncomfortable because he's got to find a plausible denial around somebody who's clearly, as you say, really analytical, a really clear, straight thinker. And it's going to be hard to just sort of laugh it off. He has to come up with a convincing straight rebuttal to Graham about his own position in intelligence. Right. And, and, you know, I'm kind of thinking from Stephen's viewpoint, you know, for somebody to make this kind of bumbling, straightforward, just put it all on the table recruitment thing. I imagine Stephen's thinking, you know, this is the kind of intelligence agent that I would run miles yeah. away from very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> you would like, you know, think back to the conversation with Duhamel and Stephen, yeah. you know, none of the nuance, none of the subtlety, none of the things that Brian Wilson has been talking about, mm-hmm. you know, as we talked before about giving signals to each other. And, and O'Brien kind of takes us right here. So as Graham recruits him, O'Brien writes that Stephen's watching the distant ape as it shook its fist at the vulture. So now I'm realizing (laughs) Stephen's the ape, Graham is the vulture, and the bird glides away just as Stephen says to Graham, you know, he's just a mere naval surgeon. He rarely goes on shore or away from his patients, can't get away. He would make a very indifferent source of information. And then He also adds, the deceit called for in such an endeavor might be mighty distasteful. So I I love how he's telling the moral philosopher (laughs) he doesn't like this idea of the deceitfulness of the whole undertaking. And he suggests to Graham, though, you know, to to your point, again, how do I how do I defer him? How do I get him away from here? He says that one of their clerical shipmates, one of these naval chapmans they have on board would be perfect that these guys are on shore a lot. They have lots of time. They know people's secrets. Um, But Graham notes that all of the chaplains, except for Mr. Martin, are are now leaving at this stop here. And and in the midst of this whole conversation, too, um, as as you said, with this cinematic picture here, we've got Stephen trying to point things out to Graham, and, and we realize how little Graham knows about naval matters, how little he knows about nature. You know, Stephen's getting a little irritated with him because Graham never understands any of Stephen's references here. Yeah. So, so a bit of a tangled web between these two characters. What's it going to take for Patrick O'Brien to resolve a tangled web? I know what it is, Mike. It's going to be a dinner. So there's going to be 
with, yeah. with all of the parsons due to set off and uh, and leave the ship there's a farewell dinner in the wardroom captain aubrey's invited so he's the guest of the wardroom girl tom pullings is in the chair Stephen, of course is the last to arrive he's carried in literally by the elbows right after jack arrives and who have we got in the wardroom great news we've got some old friends besides pulling we've got moat and moat greets them with poetry and Stephen surprises moat by recognizing and recalling some of the poetry that uh, moat came up with in their first commission i don't know how many books ago but certainly many years ago in the timeline in impeccable iambic pentameter we get oh were it mine with sacred morrow's art to wake to sympathy the feeling heart then might i with unrivaled strains deplore the impervious horrors of a leeward shore wonderful and uh, how many times have we heard a lee shore as being referred to with as, as impervious horror mike not above a dozen already <laughs> right right i love it and and i i love we were you know getting ready for this and it, it was just yesterday that you had retweeted yes. a, a lee shore reference which was fabulous yeah and Stephen's showing off again, but I think he's showing off on safer ground, having successfully remembered Moet's poetry. And of course, Moet's a friend. Anything that the Doctor says to recall their old uh, their old relationship together, I think is going to make Moet's heart glow. And the rest of the wardroom cheer Moet on as well. He gets asked to repeat his verse about woe. I think it's Jack who calls him out and says, give us that piece about woe. And Moet says, by woe, the soul to daring action swells. By woe, its plaintless patience, it excels from patience, prudent, clear experience springs and traces knowledge through the course of things. Thence hope is formed, thence fortitude, success, renown, whate'er men covet and caress, which is really beautifully constructed rhythmic poetry. Well done. Yes. Well, well done, James Mowat with the help of Patrick O'Brien. Well, and, and I love after, you know, we talked at the end of last week again about how Helter Skelter O'Brien's references to these musical pieces are that O'Brien's gone out of the way to find actual naval officers poetry from the time that he inserts in here. And he sources it in his, his kind of uh, forward to the, to the Ionian mission. <laughs> oh, you know, forget about the music. I'll just make that up. But the poetry, I've got to get that exactly right here. Yeah, we see where uh, where O'Brien's heart lies when it comes to all the artistic and cultural references here. Right. right. Um, this the, Lee Shore as a subject for poetry and Woe being a subject for poetry, this looks like some ominous foreshadowing though, doesn't it, Mike? This doesn't sound like you know, poetry about love or drinking or singing. This is poetry about darkness. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I feel like, you know, you're kind of in the movie theater and you realize you're starting to get a little tense and it's the, you know, it's the soundtrack that's starting to wind you up here. That's uh oh, something's going to happen here. Yeah. The dinner is a bit subdued. It seems like they don't all know each other quite as well as they like to. And they haven't all at the beginning got quite as much alcohol on board as they might need. So Jack's aware that they're all awed by his reputation. He can tell that Pullings is working very hard to keep the conversation flowing. There are Parsons at the table, so dirty jokes and dirty songs are out. There are lots of people who don't have naval experience, so chatting about other ships and you know, rigging techniques, that's not quite going to keep the conversation flowing. So they just eat and drink and chew away on their food. And Lieutenant Summers, who I think we're duty-bound to dislike, drinks a good deal even though he's pretty sniffy about the quality of the claret. Right, right. Pullings sends a bottle around, and at long last, he's having some success trying to liven up the party, drinks a wine with anybody who'll make eye contact with him, toasting, asking people about interests, and to his rescue, I think, Mike, comes the arrival of the pudding. Yeah, the pudding. And and this is, you know, it's funny, you introduced me to pudding many years ago. <laughs> I thought pudding was like chocolate or vanilla, and it was something my mom made out of a box, and that was it. That was pudding. But pudding, you know, being this incredible dessert here, and, and I love it. I mean, O'Brien just takes pains here. He says, the pudding was Jack's favorite, a spotted dog, and a spotted dog fit for a line of battleship carried in by two strong men. 
Bless me, cried Jack with a loving look at its glistening, faintly translucent sides. A spotted dog. Uh, Pullwing says, we thought as how you might like one, sir. Allow me to carve you a slice. So Jack, you know, in this merriment, he turns to Professor Graham and says, did you know, sir, this is the first decent pudding I've had since I left home. By some mischance, the suet was neglected to be shipped. And you will agree that a spotted dog or a drowned baby is a hollow mockery, a whited sepulcher without its made with suet. There is an art in puddings, to be sure. But what is art without suet? Amen. Now, I, do we all know what suet is? Mike, are you down with suet? Uh, you know, I'd love to know. But I, I actually <laughs> wanted to know much more about puddings, about boiled babies and spotted dogs, and definitely about suet. I'm thinking, I hear suet, and I'm thinking like birdseed, but I, I don't know. What's suet? Uh, su- suet is, is gr- grated animal fat. It's fat taken from beneath the skin of it, normally of a cow. So it's oh. and it's normally kind of grated and dried, and you use it as a substitute for for any other cooking fat like like butter or margarine in making typically heavy, calorific, glutinous but delicious puddings and pies and stuff like that. So that's that's what suet is. Um, it's a kind of thing that is a special treat, really. I, I, I don't think you'd expect very many sacks of suet to last long in the hold of a warship. So oh, it's a big deal. And clearly, Jack Jack worships the idea of a suet pudding, especially a spotted dog. Fantastic. Well, this is one of these things where O'Brien, with his knack for accuracy and detail, but we find that if we look across, and, and this is only a very, very, very minor spoiler <laughs> for yeah. anybody here. I'm, I'm going to let on for people to know that across the canon, different books mentioned Jack's favorite pudding, but it's not always the same. <laughs> so, sometimes it's roly <laughs> poly, sometimes it's boiled baby, this time it was spotted dog. I couldn't help but think to myself that perhaps Jack was a bit ahead of his time and anticipating that great theme from Crosby, Stills, and Nash, who, who actually had taken it from Billy Preston, mm-hmm. that if you can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with. Uh, for mm-hmm. Jack, love the pudding you're with, or maybe for our Jack, it goes beyond just puddings. Could be. Could be. I'm pretty sure here that the metaphor is beyond just just a dessert. Just like I didn't know about suet, I, I really got, as I went through the canon, uh, you know, I, a spotted dog, boiled baby. What are these dishes here? And and are, are there any resources, Ian, that, that can help our listeners with these things? Anybody who's, who's perhaps... Mm-hmm kind of trapped in in the pandemic can't order out food <laughs> or something new that they might try yeah, yeah i've had enough dried noodles well if you're curious about spotted dog curiously enough if you go to amazon and just search for the term spotted dog you will get straight to a great book called lobscouse and spotted dog which it's a gastronomic companion to the aubrey maturin novels and there's great information in this book um it's by Anne grossman and lisa thomas it's a cookbook with food and drink facts and quotes from the novels recipes i think for all of the dishes that you find in the canon and in the foreword patrick o'brien himself introduces the book and said that it might be most valuable in america he says a country to which i am profoundly attached because in all the thousands of miles that he traveled the u.s o'brien had only once had a real pudding spotted dog says o'brien will improve the quality of life bring back much that was lost with the advent of the industrial revolution and restore a dinner table worthy of an even harder Thanksgiving. So there you go. Like we, we get a happy Thanksgiving reference from Patrick O'Brien in the week of Thanksgiving. So to all our listeners out there, uh, belatedly, because you'll be hearing this after the day, but belatedly, happy Thanksgiving. Yeah, I hope you have a heartier Thanksgiving, pudding or not, a glass of wine with each of you. Amen. This is all going well. We've had this lovely bucolic scene. We've had the dinner we've had the poetry we've had toasts and wine and jocularity culminating with the pudding but it's going to cause a problem graham is at the table and he replies that in addition to there being art in puddings there are puddings in art he's remembering this little throwaway jokey line that stephen gave him just the day before and he says i learned that you trice puddings athwart the starboard gumbrels when sailing by and large and I, I can only imagine, Mike, that this would either have been a pin-dropping silence in the wardroom while they all dropped their jaws and turned to look at this guy who said this ridiculously unnautical thing, or 
outrage and it's outrage we get the wardroom erupting into by and large gumbrels starboard gumbrels and jack bless him pretty quickly realizes and he says out loud to professor graham somebody must have been practicing upon the professor's credulity an ancient form of naval wit played off many in many a time on newly joined gentlemen by pullings and mowat on dr maturin in former years but never to has his knowledge on any man of graham's eminence and i think this is nice of jack to try and smooth things over but he publicly and undeniably puts the finger on what has happened and this is causing some discomfort now for Stephen and causing a bit of a rift in his relationship with Graham. Yeah, I think you know Jack tells Graham that clearly somebody's been practicing upon him but then he sees this look, you know, this look on Stephen's face it's like uh-oh, now I realize who it was and and he he wishes he has those words back. He starts to try to go into an alternate explanation about some archaic phrase but the wardroom is now all over it, and every one of them is explaining to Graham how ridiculous all these statements are. And and O'Brien does not phrase it this way. I'm, I'm not sure that this would be a term that he would have used back then, but I think we can say that Graham is well and truly pissed. He is, oh, yes. He's not happy. Right? <laughs> he, he is very cold, very distant towards Stephen. You know, he, there's one other little interchange in this dinner, but then for days, Graham does not speak to, to Stephen, except when he's being lowered off the ship. Uh, he just says, good day to you, to Stephen, as he, he leaves the ship off of Cape Mola, you know, to be headed on to, to his destination. And uh, Stephen, though, is very glad that Graham <laughs> will no longer think of him as a potential intelligence agent. And as yeah. Stephen says, still less as one in fact, dear mother of God. Yeah, small comfort. <laughs> so Stephen's going to have to cast around for somebody else to be a conversation partner and friend with. But he learns that there's another one waiting in line. Mr. Martin, I think his first name is Nathaniel. Nathaniel Martin. And this is going to come back. We know that Martin is the one eye parson. We discover why. Uh, Martin, it, we learn, he gave up his eye for a look at an owl. And Martin himself explains, the poor bird only meant to protect her brood. She could not tell I meant them no harm. I was culpably abrupt in my movements. Besides, it is convenient when looking through a spyglass not to have to close the other eye. So Stephen's got a natural philosophy friend as opposed to a moral philosophy enemy. Absolutely. And, and a man after Stephen's own heart. Certainly it's not the owl's fault. It's mine. <laughs> I love this. Yeah. Oh, that reminds me, what, what, what were the birds in Desolation Island? This is Stephen and Herapath sitting on an island um, offshore of where the leopards and the rest of the ship's crew are trying to rebuild the leopard. And Herapath reports being sp spat oil at by a petrel. And Stephen does the same thing. He anthropomorphizes the birds. He says, petrels cannot abide the least gaucherie. And kind of right. puts it on Herapath. And I think we've got the same little gesture here happening with Martin's story of, of him coming to grief at the hands of an owl. Anyhow, Stephen and Martin are bird watching when they see Lieutenant Summers. Boo, Lieutenant Summers. They see Lieutenant right. Summers coming back with the boat that dropped off Graham. And there's something odd going on here. The officers on the quarter deck don't look pleased with Summers' handling of the boat. Aubrey tells them to get underway and to give Summers a gun. A spar carries away on Summers' boat. And Jack asks them to send Summers to his cabin. And Mike, we've been here before. This is Lieutenant in bad odor with the captain getting a dressing down that pretty much everybody's going to get the chance to overhear. Big time. Big time. Sure enough, O'Brien doesn't take us in. Um, we don't learn what the conversation is about. But we do see Summers coming out of Jack's cabin completely red-faced at dinner. Uh, after that, he's surly and resentful. Mm -hmm. and, and interestingly, I, I, I like the way that Ryan tells us that the other officers try to cheer him up because they realize, you know, on the ship, we're all going to have to be together for a very long time. And so there's this usual convention of if there's any unpleasantness up on the deck that's happened, but you, know, you leave it behind, you get to table. We all have to sort of get yeah. along here. But, but Summers is having none of that. Um, there's no cheering up and everything. And towards the end of the dinner, Summers is talking to Mr. Martin, you know, Stephen's friend, and, and a younger Marine lieutenant named Jackson. And he's talking about the differences, O'Brien writes here, between bosun captains and gentlemen captains. The first, the bosun captains, 
being those who pay great attention to mechanical duties, the province of mere mariners. The second, these gentlemen captains, being the true soul of the Navy, high-spirited men who left such things to their inferiors, reserving all their energies for a superior general direction for battle, in which they led their men who respected, almost worshipped them, incomparably well. He grew almost as enthusiastic about gentlemen as Stephen had been about the wandering albatross. And Summers goes on to say, the common people instinctively recognized blood and accepted its superiority. They knew that a man of ancient lineage was, as it were, of another essence, and they could distinguish him at once, almost as though he wore a halo. So we've got a pretty good feel for who Summers thinks he is and who yeah. he thinks Jack is. Here. Yeah, and, and I think of what we're supposed to think of Summers as well, because yes. it's, it's one of O'Brien's big, big hates is uh, is arrogance and presumption on the part of privileged people. And Summers is clearly that. And it's not just a hint anymore. We're really allowed to take a properly, a properly deep dislike to this arrogant snob Summers. And the sad thing is that we hear that the junior members of the mess, Jackson, admire Summers for his good looks and his wealth, applauds Summers until he notices that some of his companions around the table are looking a bit grave. And Summers is too drunk at this point to notice. And he gets drunker and drunker. And finally, he's bundled into his cot and can't turn out for his duty the next day. Um, Stephen notices that he seemed to be one of those men who was showy and arrogant in public, but pleasant enough with just one companion. And Mike, that sounds to me, I, I hear a bit of a connection to James Dillon, but I hear a big connection to Clonfort from the Mauritius Command. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well spotted. Wow. Yeah. Two great connections. Here we've got Summers, we've got Graham, we've got, and now we're back with Stephen and Mr. Martin as they continue to watch and discuss birds together and sharing a lot of their past experiences. And Martin continues to share with Stephen, you know, time and again, that, that the Navy really is the life for him, that he loves it. It's got friendly companions. He has a, a comfortable cabin, despite the, the large cannon that's in it. He has luxurious meals. There's wine daily and, and really good pay. Mm. And he's kind of telling that as a naturalist, as a social person, he really much prefers naval life to, you know, his past life of living in a cellar working for a bookseller, and, and I think we're meant to read underneath that, living the life of an impoverished parson on shore. Um, mm. Stephen, you know, kind of supports him, but always tries to give him a, a little bit of the other side of naval life. But uh, they, they're kind of going back and forth, talking about this a little bit, and, and, and there's this great comic interlude. Oh, yeah, Stephen and Martin are being chased around the deck because – We've had our bucolic time, we've had our social time, but we're coming back into naval service discipline time. The Worcester is approaching station where it's going to meet the squadron commander by Admiral Thornton. And Pullings is really, really anxious to get the ship looking absolutely top class. You will not touch anything, will you, Doctor? Everything's quite clean, fit for the Admiral's inspection. And Martin's considering acting as a, as a schoolmaster for the... Uh, for the ship's young boys to add to his chaplain's salary, Stephen dissuades him on the ground that this is a philosophically, you know, disadvantageous thing. Teaching young gentlemen, he said, has a dismal effect upon the soul. It exemplifies the badness of established artificial authority. The pedagogue, the teacher, has almost absolute authority over his pupils, beats them, loses the sense of respect due to them as fellow human beings, does them harm, becomes the all-knowing tyrant, always right always virtuous and Stephen's really got it in for schoolmasters right and maybe maybe he's telling himself off a little bit for presuming knowledge and doing some mansplaining to uh to graham a little bit earlier on i often wonder if his real big rants are sometimes perhaps a bit self-directed anyway mm. ra Stephen wraps this up saying have you ever known a schoolmaster fit to associate with grown men the dear knows i never have they are most horribly warped indeed <sighs> no, nah, sorry, sorry, O'Brien. I'm not down with this at all. Come from a family of school teachers. I think you're miles off. But again, I think we're hearing something about Stephen's state of mind and his desire to express 
a, a trenchant opinion about people who lord their knowledge over other people. Right. And, and, you know, we've got sort of this Stephen's usual refrain back to the, you know, the, the, the horrible impacts of authority on people. It's interesting because we know that, uh, you know, as we said, Jackson needed some redemption, but they're getting closer to the admiral in this kind of, you know, very routine duty here in Toulon. And interestingly, after this kind of fun discussion back and forth with Stephen and Martin, after watching Pullings kind of chasing them all over the deck, all over the deck, um, and and you know Stephen even you know kind of uh, you know, touching the paint as as all the usual stuff here, we finally have Stephen who's been pretty easy on Martin, trying to temper Martin's great enthusiasm for naval life. And he reminds him that the Navy's prime function is to take, burn, or destroy the enemy. And he's he's just launching into this <laughs> as the sails of the Admiral's fleet are spotted here. Fantastic. This means that I think our little discussion into philosophy and personal relationships and shaking down the ship, I think that chapter is just about done, Mike. I think it's time for the Worcester to be put to serious naval action. And I, I wonder if this means we get a, a further chance at redemption for Jack Aubrey. I wonder if this means that Maturin can get on with his uh, his intelligence work without being second guessed by Professor Graham and the like. I wonder what this means for the bird watching prospects for Martin and Maturin together. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm really fascinated because I'm, I'm just sort of, as always, I've kind of given up asking where is this headed exactly because we know that o'brien has all these strands that he can weave together and probably some we haven't even thought of so far so very much looking forward to you know joining those sails ahead with the admiral's fleet and finding out what's in store next time what do you say ian to a little bit more patrick o'brien mike with all my heart some kind of mission involved to, to the Ionian perhaps I'm, I don't know I know I know I keep what and he, he puts these you know he puts these things in the title and it's like